A Russian submarine gets tangled in an old fishing net. The crew are trapped, 200 meters under the sea. Even the easiest of movements made you short of breath. The British Navy scrambles to reach them, but every delay means less oxygen. Things are not happening fast enough. This is the inside story of one of the most audacious rescues in submarine history. Russia, the Kamchatka Peninsula, Berezovoya Bay, 16 kilometers offshore. The Russian Navy prepares to launch a small submarine, the Priz AS-28. The seven-man crew enjoy their last minutes on deck before the dive. Captain Lieutenant Slava Milashevsky is in command. It was a routine dive. This wasn't the first time. There was nothing unusual about it. Engineer Gennady Bolanin is the oldest member of the tight-knit crew. These are people I had worked with for many years. Our relationship, it's not just official. We're friends. 11.48 a.m. The crew goes into action. Their mini-sub is 16 years old and designed to rescue stricken nuclear submarines. It is 13 meters long and can make repairs with two mechanical arms at the front. An airtight docking hatch allows it to deliver oxygen and supplies or evacuate the crew. Today, the Priz has a different task. The crew is scheduled to carry out repairs on a relic from the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West. It's a secret listening device designed to track American submarines, one of many that line this part of the coast. They're here because Kamchatka faces the USA across the North Pacific, allowing the Russians to monitor American naval activity to this day. The listening devices need regular maintenance. Discarded fishing nets sometimes drift into them. The crew expect today's mission to take no more than six hours. The Priz runs on batteries and cannot spend long underwater. As the submarine descends, water pressure on the hull increases. At 65 meters, it reaches nearly 100 pounds per square inch. Sure. The crew are on edge. Since the Cold War, savage budget cuts in the Russian Navy have taken a toll on maintenance. Accidents caused by rundown equipment have killed dozens of sailors. The deeper the submarine dives, the more likely it is to develop a fault. At 200 meters, water pressure reaches 300 pounds per square inch, enough to crush a man. The giant eavesdropping device comes into view. Two 100 meter long cylinders house hundreds of underwater microphones tuned to detect enemy submarines. The crew must be careful. It's impossible to see more than 10 meters. Their priority is to avoid electric cables connected to the listening device. The 
the submarine could damage them. But there's something else hidden in the gloom. The Priz edges closer. Until the crew suddenly see the fishing net. Milosevsky orders his helmsman to reverse. But part of the net is now behind the submarine. As we were reversing, one of the engine screws went into the net. The engine defense mechanism was activated. We realized what had happened. We were entangled. Seconds later, they feel the Priz lurch to a halt. Milosevsky forces himself to stay calm. He knows the submarine could still break free. He tries every maneuver he can think of. But soon, the sub will hardly move at all. We didn't just get into it. We tried to sail away, to reverse. We did everything we could. A chill spreads through the crew. It's every submariner's worst nightmare. Trapped deep underwater with limited oxygen. One p.m. Senior warrant officer Anatoly Popov makes an SOS call to the submarine's mothership, 200 meters above. There was no way we could have saved ourselves. We were waiting for help from the outside. The crew know the Russian Navy has a poor record of saving trapped submariners. One incident in particular preys on their minds. Five years ago, a torpedo exploded on board the Kursk nuclear submarine. The sailors who survived the explosion were trapped 108 meters below the surface of the Barents Sea. Priz-class rescue subs tried and failed to dock with the Kursk, and the government refused to ask for foreign help until it was too late. All 118 men on board died. The Priz lies nearly twice as deep as the doomed Kursk. My opinion was that our Russian forces would be unlikely to save us. The mothership calls back with a solution. They've decided to launch a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, called Venom. The machine has two robotic arms which could cut the Priz free. But the captain faces a problem. The regular operating team are on leave. He orders an inexperienced technician to man the system. Within seconds, the craft is out of control. The umbilical cable twists and breaks. Venom is already out of action. Two hundred meters down, the seven-man crew of the Priz realize that unless there is some kind of miracle, they are facing certain death. An old fishing net has trapped a Russian mini-submarine deep in the North Pacific. Captain Lieutenant Slava Milosevsky knows the chances of rescue are small, but he's determined to try and save his men. Well, hope never dies. There is always some hope. We thought the worst possible scenario was possible, but we were ready for it. The whole crew was trained for it. Milosevsky checks the supplies. On board are seven emergency oxygen-generating canisters. The water was found by accident in a barrel. We didn't know if it was drinkable. 
there was about three or four liters inside. We didn't know how long we would need to stretch this. All they have to eat are some biscuits. Milishevsky makes a chilling calculation. Each oxygen generating canister has the capacity to keep the crew alive for around nine hours. With seven canisters on board, that gives just 63 hours in total. Even if they do all they can to conserve oxygen, 80 hours is probably all they can hope for. <sighs> Milishevsky orders his men to don their thermal suits. They'll turn off all non-essential equipment, including the heating system, to save battery power. To reduce oxygen consumption, they'll keep still, breathe slowly, and talk as little as possible. The most important thing was discipline. The main priority was not to panic, but to think about survival, about our chances, about our situation. The Russian Navy deploys a rescue fleet of 10 ships, and like the Kursk, keeps the crisis a secret. They have no other operational pris class subs in the Pacific. Their only option is to try and hook the AS-28 with cables, then drag it to shallower water. Soon after switching off power, the crew feel the temperature drop. Within hours, it equalizes with the sea, just four degrees Celsius. With every breath, the submariners are changing the air in the submarine. Their lungs absorb oxygen and excrete carbon dioxide. It's a potentially deadly cycle. If oxygen in the submarine drops from the normal 21% to below 10%, the crew will pass out and die. But carbon dioxide is just as deadly. If it reaches just 2%, it becomes toxic. At 10%, CO2 is fatal. Milashevsky opens the first oxygen-generating canister. It contains potassium superoxide, a chemical which reacts with air to produce oxygen. Crucially, potassium superoxide also absorbs carbon dioxide. Now, there are just six canisters left. The following morning in Petropavlovsk, Kamchatka's capital, journalist Guzel Latipova takes a call. It's just after 11 a.m. When I answered, I heard a woman crying. She said in Berezavoye Bay, a submarine with seven sailors has sunk 220 meters underwater. I asked who she was, but she wouldn't tell me. When the Navy refuses to comment, Guzel knows the story is true. She broadcasts immediately. The news spreads quickly through the media. That afternoon, a Russian Navy spokesman confirms the facts. Milashevsky's wife, Elena, is at home with the couple's twin daughters, Sasha and Nastya. While preparing dinner, she hears the word mini-submarine in a TV news bulletin. I knew that only Slava's mini-submarine was working at the time. Elena knows immediately there is only a small chance of rescue. She fears the worst. I kept thinking, what would I say to my children when they asked me, where is daddy? For them, their father is everything. The crew have now been underwater for 32 hours. They force themselves to make every oxygen-generating canister last as long as possible. They delay opening each new one until it's almost impossible to breathe. We started stretching it out to make it last longer than recommended in the instructions. The 
effects of oxygen depletion and carbon dioxide poisoning kick in. Gasping for breath, dizziness, nausea, and headaches. 8,000 kilometers away in Great Britain, in Bristol, it's 7 a.m. Commander Ian Riches wakes with the morning news. He's the Royal Navy officer in charge of the UK Submarine Rescue Service. There was a very brief article about a, a Russian submarine stuck on the seabed in the Pacific Ocean. So I was up and uh, dressed and off to work as quickly as possible. The UK Submarine Rescue Service depot is 600 kilometers to the north in Glasgow, Scotland. Team leader Stuart Gold hears the same bulletin on his way to work. The news packs an emotional punch. Stuart's team rushed to the Kursk five years ago when Russia finally asked for foreign help. By then, it was too late. We were all affected uh, by the, the Kursk disaster. Um, it was a very, very, very sad moment. If they can reach the prison time, they could prevent a second tragedy. We are contracted by our Ministry of Defence to be on the road, out of our uh, headquarters within 12 hours, to be ready for a mobilisation um, as quickly as possible anywhere in the world. Uh, we're getting ready to mobilise. At the depot, there's an air of excitement. The team know they have the machine for the job. A tried and tested ROV known as Scorpio 45. Scorpio can dive to a depth of nearly 1,000 meters. Its mechanical arms can cut through steel cables. Crucially, it could be flown to Kamchatka and be in action within hours of landing. People will reckon it is just a machine, but to, to me it's um, a way of life. We look at the Scorpio as another person, as another part of the team. Stuart can't deploy Scorpio unless Russia asks Britain for help. But the admirals of the Pacific Fleet refuse to allow former Cold War enemies near a secret listening device. Their own rescue fleet is trying to hook the Priz with cables. The Russians are operating blind at a depth of 200 meters. The chances of success are small. If Russia doesn't ask for foreign help soon, it'll be too late for anybody to reach the Priz in time. The crew of a Russian mini-submarine have been trapped underwater for more than 30 hours. The seven men are cold and thirsty. Water is rationed to four sips a day. The effects of low oxygen and high carbon dioxide levels are getting worse. It was harder to breathe. Even the easiest of movements, even a couple of steps, made you short of breath. Hope begins to disappear. Everybody in the crew went through their own emotions. There were tears in some people's eyes. Milosevsky thinks of his family. He writes a final goodbye to Elena and the twins. In Petropavlovsk, Elena watches every bulletin for news of her husband. I felt 100% hopeless. I was 100% sure they would not be rescued. My heart suddenly started to ache, and I couldn't control my arms and legs. I was in no state to do anything. In Moscow, President Vladimir Putin's staff brief him about the crisis. Putin cannot risk the political fallout from another submarine disaster like the Kursk. He tells his admirals to request foreign help immediately. They contact the U.S. Pacific Fleet Deep Submergence Unit in San Diego, California, 7,000 kilometers southeast of Kamchatka. Like the British, 
It is equipped with Scorpio-class ROVs. Commander Kent Van Horn briefs the media. We'll get there as quickly as we possibly can. At the British Embassy in Moscow, Captain Jonathan Holloway, Britain's naval attaché, monitors the crisis. Holloway is a former submariner. I was desperate to do anything that we could. Being stuck on the bottom is every submariner's nightmare. You know you have limited oxygen supply, and if help can't get to you, you're going to die very slowly and very uncomfortably. The Russians haven't contacted Britain, but Holloway calls the UK submarine rescue service anyway. I said, look, there's a possibility this is going to happen, so I think you should do everything you can to speed this up and make it happen. Great, excellent. Right, lads, to go up. Team leader Stuart Gold begins loading Scorpio. Initially, it was just like an exercise, and we really thought the Americans were going to get there first. A Royal Air Force C-17 is on standby to fly the ROV and its control cabin to Kamchatka. We took a very bold decision, and thankfully that was taken up by all, all the other people. The Ministry of Defence were very quick to task the aircraft and say, let's get it loaded ahead of time so we're saving time all the time. Stewart scrambles Scorpio's eight-man operating team and hits a problem. His senior pilot is unavailable. He knows only one other man experienced enough for the job. Peter Nuttall is packing for his cousin's wedding when he gets the call. Hey, Stuart. Listen, we've got a big job on. Can you help me out? Originally, I thought, he's got to be kidding. I thought, he knows that I'm going to the wedding. It's, it's just a wind-up. Where is it? But from the tone in his voice, I knew straight away he was not joking, and he was deadly serious. Of course, I'll be there right away. Peter abandons the wedding. It's, uh, it's part of the job. In Moscow, Holloway heads for the Russian Ministry of Defense to deliver a diplomatic note. It contains an official offer of British help. If the Russians say no, everything done by the British so far will have been in vain. We sat there and I described what we could do, passed across the note. And I was then asked to wait. Throughout this whole process, I was very aware of the fact that the, the clock was ticking and that time was running out. Holloway's strategy works. Once the British offer has been passed to the Russian Navy, it is accepted almost immediately. Thank you again, Major. Although Scorpio is already on the way to the airport, the chances of success are on a knife edge. With no delays, it will take at least 24 hours to reach the Priz by land, air, and sea. The submariners may have less than 50 hours of oxygen left. The race is on. I would like to say that uh, we can definitely do it. What worries me is that I know we're running out of time. The British finish loading their C-17 and take off at 8.15 p.m. UK time. The flight to Kamchatka will take 10 hours. The worst scenarios were, were going through your mind, that they were dead already, that, you know, this was a wasted journey. The Americans leave San Diego just under two hours later. News that foreign rescuers are on the way raises morale on board the Priz, but not for long. With conditions worsening, help may well come too late. We didn't know when the help was going to come. Would it be tomorrow, the day after, in two hours or 72 hours? We had no idea. 6.22 p.m., Kamchatka time. The British touchdown at Petropavlovsk Airport, ahead of the Americans. 
They expect to unload Scorpio fast, but although the Russians have provided trucks, there's no heavy lifting gear. Without the gear to get the uh, containers out of the C-17, we're as much as no good whatsoever. After 20 hours of frantic activity and an 8,000 kilometer flight, the rescue mission grinds to a halt. Seven submariners' lives depend on finding heavy lifting gear and fast. A British rescue team has raced halfway around the world to save a Russian submarine crew. But on arrival in Kamchatka, they're stranded. Except for a small forklift truck, there's nothing to unload their specialized equipment. I felt the whole operation could, could, could fizzle out. We managed to lift Scorpio herself out with, the, with, with a forklift truck, but everything else was a lot heavier than that. An hour and a half later, the American rescue team arrives from San Diego. Like an answer to British prayers, there is heavy lifting gear on board their giant C-5 aircraft. The Americans immediately help the British, who despite their problems, are well ahead with their offloading. The Americans turned up, not so much out of the blue, but certainly out of the grey, and they turned up at, like the 7th Cavalry. Stewart and his team head for Petropavlovsk Harbour 45 minutes later, leaving the Americans behind. It was very, very dark, um, a bit like a, a James Bond movie. A lot of overground uh, pipes, not a lot of people going about. The road is in terrible condition. The driver was driving fairly quickly and hitting potholes with some gusto, so we were being bounced around. We did start to have a few concerns that uh, the equipment might not have arrived uh, all, uh, in one piece. It takes an hour to reach the dock perimeter. What's happening? But the gate is closed. They wouldn't let us in. It was as simple as that. This chap had not been told we were coming, so he wasn't going to let us in. The rescue ship waits at the jetty. The crew of the Priz have just three oxygen-generating canisters left. They hardly have the strength to open them. Two people were needed to open the canister. One would use pliers and another one a spanner. This is how our physical abilities changed as a result of carbon dioxide poisoning. Still, the argument at the dockside rages. People were getting short-tempered. We knew that the clock was ticking. We knew there was lives at stake. And things weren't happening fast enough. It takes half an hour for the guard superior officers to grant permission to open the gate. Thank you, Hablad. Stuart and Ian reach Petropavlovsk Harbour in the early morning. Then, a sudden boost to morale. There was this shock of white blonde hair. They recognised Dmitry Podkopayev, the Russian Navy officer in charge of the rescue. Dmitry was just, it was just a, a sight for sore eyes at that stage. Dmitry was part of the team that tried to save the Kursk. And he worked with the British on a training exercise in Italy just two weeks ago. He just grabbed us and was so enthusiastic to see us because he'd seen what we could do. He understood that if anybody could pull this off, that it was probably us. The team begin loading Scorpio. Putting Scorpio onto a ship takes a couple of hours. And because it's been on so many ships, we know where it goes. Meanwhile, Dmitry briefs the British. A Russian underwater camera has revealed that the Priz is ensnared by ten ropes. Yeah. Stewart thinks Scorpio can cut them, 
But then another serious problem emerges. Has the vessel got dynamic positioning? No dynamic positioning. It was like the whole world was coming to an end. The ROV is normally operated from a ship with bow and stern thrusters linked to a global positioning system. Together, they automatically keep the vessel in a fixed position above its target. But the Russian rescue ship doesn't have this technology. Any movements during the rescue could pull Scorpio out of position by its umbilical control cable. Look at that. Dimitri improvises a solution. Two ships with deep sea anchors will hold the rescue vessel in position with tow ropes. Go here and here. The plan could work, but only if the sea remains calm. The rescue ship sets sail for Berezovoya Bay. The 70-kilometer journey alone will take another five hours. Time is running out. Elena, Milishevsky's wife, believes the rescue operation is futile. I thought even the rescuers, who were due to arrive, wouldn't be able to save the crew because by that time, there shouldn't have been any air left. The Americans have by now reached Petropavlovsk harbor, but the Russians keep them here knowing that the British are already on the scene. When they reach Berezovoya Bay, everyone is relieved that the sea is calm. The rescue ship maneuvers into position above the listening device. Two other vessels, which have dropped their deep sea anchors, hold her steady. 200 meters below, the trapped submariners are entering a critical phase. There was clear carbon dioxide poisoning. You could see it even in the healthiest guys on board who were feeling sick. Not just feeling sick, they were really puking. At 10.25 a.m. on day four, Scorpio finally goes into action. Stuart and the rest of the team join Peter in the control room. They haven't slept for nearly two days. I'm constantly reminding myself that there's seven lives at stake here. And we're told that there's only anything between 10 and 12 hours life support left. 100 meters. this footage and at that point we felt a sense of relief we've got there and, and to get there was was certainly quite a, quite a journey after 72 hours underwater the air in the submarine is foul the crew feel paralyzed by exhaustion Milashevsky's perception of reality is blurring. deliberately knocking the hull of the submarine with Scorpio. Basically, you're saying to them, we're here and we'll do our best to get you out. Excellent. Hello, boys. (laughs) 
Milashevsky struggles to the periscope. And sees the ROV. There was a lot of joy. The whole crew perked up, got ready, help had arrived, and there was real hope. Stewart grasps the controls for Scorpio's manipulator. Every move he makes will be mirrored on the ROV itself. The cutter is at the end of another arm and is much less maneuverable. No one knows how long cutting the ropes will take or how much oxygen the submariners have left. Every minute counts. Peter edges Scorpio into position for the first cut. I had to have the cutter positioned properly so that it would cut the cable or catch the cable with one arm and move it to the other. It isn't easy. Scorpio's umbilical is connected to the rescue ship which drifts in and out of position, despite the two stabilizing vessels. 40 minutes after reaching the Priz, Scorpio grasps the first cable firmly. Almost there, coming in now. One down, nine to go. Each cut is a major challenge. Many of the ropes are tightly bound and difficult to grasp. Others are wrapped in netting. Well, the cutter's not designed to cut true fishing net, so it takes us a bit longer than we would have certainly anticipated. They came, started working, started cutting. You could feel it. It really felt like, you know, when someone is stroking you on the head, the same kind of tender feeling. It felt so comforting. Three hours into the operation, there are only three more ropes to cut. Come on in. One of Scorpio's electrical junction boxes begins losing pressure. Water could seep into the system. Obviously, you don't want to mix water with heavy electrics. The team take a risk and continue cutting. They try to grasp the eighth rope. Seconds later, they watch in horror as a flange on the cutting arm bends and covers the blade. Now it will be almost impossible to cut another rope. Bend the flange. It seems to be one problem after another. It's always a barrier. There's always an obstacle we've got to go over. Stewart knows Scorpio must be brought back to deck and repaired immediately. But Dimitri insists the ROV continues working. It was quite distressing. I tried to assure Dimitri that this wouldn't take any time at all. It's a bit like a pit stop. You know, please let us do it. Dimitri was very cross. We pointed out to him that we cannot cut because there's a piece of metal blocking the, the hole. We're not going to get any net into that. When Dimitri leaves the control room to consult his superiors, the British take matters into their own hands. They bring Scorpio back to the surface. The crew of the Priz see the ROV leaving. Suddenly, the sound stopped and disappeared. We looked at each other. What happened? The odds were starting to slip away again, having got ahead of the game. If the rescuers can't fix Scorpio and fast, Seven men could die. This is situation critical. A Russian submarine crew are running out of oxygen. But the rescue vehicle which could save them has broken down. 
A surge of adrenaline kicks Stuart Gold and his exhausted team into action. Between the six of us, we start to attack these uh, problems. The team must replace the bent flange on the cutting arm and pump oil into an electrical connection box. As they work, they discover a third problem, a loose propeller shaft. We're very fortunate that we have team members that have been in the system for many years and they're skilled at their job. They make the repairs in just 15 minutes. And I felt really glad when the ROV be back in the water, just as I promised Dimitri. The team cut all the remaining ropes. Bar one. It can only be reached from below the sub. If Scorpio approaches from underneath, the umbilical could get entangled. Both the ROV and the Priz would be trapped. I know. I don't want to cut that last one. It's too dangerous. To have the Priz stuck and the Scorpio stuck at the same time would have been an unmitigated disaster. Stuart can think of only one solution. Blow the ballast. If the Priz blows all the water from her ballast tanks, the sudden increase in buoyancy could snap the rope or shake the submarine loose. Uh, no, 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 no. Dimitri disagrees. There's only enough compressed air on board the Priz to blow ballast once. It's their last resort. We, can't. we have to blow the ballast. We went through a very big discussion, close to argument. He quite rightly said, well, what if this doesn't work? What's the fallback option? Eventually, Dimitri accepts the British argument. Now he must persuade his superiors, including the Minister of Defence, whose ship is nearby. The debate rages. Forty agonising minutes pass. It's a feeling of total frustration. Well, let's do something. Let's, let's try this operation. There's people's lives at risk. Dimitri, what's the news? Dimitri returns with a decision. I have permission. Yes, the Russian Navy has ordered the Priz to blow its ballast. Keep, keep doing. But nothing happens. And there's no way to find out why. Battery power on the sub is now so low, the crew cannot respond to messages. That's when we started to worry that they were in no fit state or, you know, or worse, to blow the tanks. Inside the Priz, the message has been received. The crew have been debating the pros and cons of blowing the ballast. Finally, they agree to trust the expertise of the rescuers. We took our positions inside the submarine. Then the order was given to blow all the ballast. This was our very final chance. Time goes on, and we're thinking, are they dead? Are they incapacitated? Um, is there a problem? Is, is, there, is there no air? Wait, what's that? Then, six hours after Scorpio started work, the Priz slowly begins to rise. She's coming up, she's coming up. And everybody rushed across to the port side. So we knew that the Priz was about 200 metres off the, the port beam of, of, of the ship. Open up to the two. My main fear is there's another rope still on the stern of it and still attached to the seabed. The next few minutes were only one or two minutes, but they seemed like an eternity. Suddenly, someone shouts. The Priz has drifted to the other side of the ship while surfacing. An amateur cameraman 
captures the scene. You know, at that point, all the emotions were let loose, and I, I, I freely admit to uh, shedding a few tears, and I think many of us did, in, in just sheer delight at seeing, seeing her back on the surface. We felt a surge of excitement when we rose and the submarine started rocking on the waves. We felt it. Thank God it was all over. The submarine has been trapped underwater for more than three days. But all seven members of the crew are alive. It felt so good to breathe. I felt like my chest was going to explode. I saw the sun, the ships around us. It was like seeing the world anew. This is how I felt. In and I looked at each other. There was this mutual understanding. We realized that we'd, we'd actually both together done something really good. The Russian Navy phones Elena. Her husband is safe. To be part of a, a team that saved seven Samara's lives. Seven bodies brought back from the deep. It um, goes without saying that uh, it was a, a great, great day for me and uh, one of the highlights of my life. Two months later, President Putin travels to London to award the team Russia's highest maritime honours. The rescue is hailed as a triumph of international cooperation. But these men remember it as the day they saved seven lives. <laughs>